I don't believe I'm, I'm, I'm not out of the ordinary. I'm a normal sort of person who likes normal everyday things. You know, I like sports. I like movies. I like normal everyday sort of stuff. I like making things. I like the garden. You know, I like, you know, I'm not a mystic in a cave somewhere. You know, I have a very normal everyday life. And if I can do it, coming from the background that I've come from, which didn't even believe in the gifts of the spirit or anything, who had no real intimacy with God or any even concept of what that might be, if God can do it with me and bring me to a point of dwelling in the presence of God and living this relationship, then I think that every, that's possible for everybody. Listening again to Kay Fairchilds and, and about um, her question this week was, what are we waiting for? And she was doing Romans about, uh, oh, yeah, the, the verse absent from the body present with the Lord and how we as Christians think we have to die and be absent from our body to actually be with God and that, that um, we're not, you know, actually able i guess to actually be with him now so that's mm -hmm. not true but she said our, our beliefs um are, are the big picture and and what we believe determines you know that's why people have believed that they have to die to go to heaven and she believes that we came here upright that God, had, everything was finished and that we were already upright. It's just we're not aware of that. So yes. because of that belief, you know, these lies have dictated our life, like penal substitution and mm -hmm. all, all these things. So so uh, she, she was using the verses, uh, Romans 8, 19, and that about the earnest expectation and she said our, our our belief of wait is is wrong there's different meanings for waiting mm. and and that basically we have to have the maturity for us to be the sons of god we already have it so uh, yeah i mean th there's a sense of everything god has done and all he has done to make us justified righteous reconcile forgiven all of those things that are already done from his perspective but people don't believe it people are not gonna experience it because right. people experience what they believe so there is a sense where the, it is finished and the work is done but that doesn't mean all people are living in that finished work because literally they either don't believe it's true at all or they believe a version of it which will twist that truth into a lesser kind of belief system um i think maturity is a measure of growth so you know you could say well i'm a child i'm not mature you could also be an adult and not mature so it, it's not just the physical but it is the knowledge of who we are and who god is that is maturity and i might not know fully who i am in the mirror of god's face because i have a distorted view of god therefore i'm not mature in knowing the reality of who i am therefore i live in an immature state um now if you think of maturity as growth then you're not mature until you mature so i can't say i'm 25 years old if i'm three years old you know it's like you have to go through the process of maturity and that's a relational process which will in our relationship with god unveil and reveal the truth so that i then can live in that truth you could say god has done everything for that truth to be outworked but i can't just know it as a program download you know it, it, there's there's a sense where you're, you're thinking of okay he has finished the work but i am not complete in that maturity process until all the things in my life which are hindering me knowing and understanding that truth and living in it are removed 
So that's a process of maturing and healing and wholeness. And I know a lot of people will think, well, in before the foundation of the world, I was perfect. Yes, your spirit was before you had a body and a soul. And when you then came into this realm as a but in a body with a soul, that is a less than perfect environment to which that which you knew in the spirit is disconnected to that which you learn to know in the soul in everyday life. So we're programmed by the life we live rather than what our spirit knows to be true until our spirit is reconnected to our soul through reconnecting to God, to which then the spirit can begin to bring the soul back into wholeness and agreement with what we always knew in the spirit. But we didn't know it in, the, in our soul cognitively. So ultimately my soul has never been in the state that my spirit was before the foundation of the world my soul was born with lost identity i know some people say well no my soul right and i'm not talking about you know original sin or you know adam's loss it's it's lost identity None of our souls know who we are because we're born in a disconnected state to God, even though he still is connected to us, loves us and wants us to know the truth. But that truth has to be relationally at work on the journey that we go through to rediscover who we are actually from his perspective. But just because he says, this is how I see you, that is not the truth until we mature into it it is the truth but it's not true for me yet let's say you see there's a distinction there what god says about me is absolutely 100 percent the truth but it's not yet the truth for me until i come into that state of conscious awareness and truth and it's outworked in my life which is a relational process Therefore, it has to take time. And the time it takes is the relationship that we establish with God. And some people, their relationship with God is absolute total priority to their lives. And they spend virtually every day, all day engaging with God. And they get to know God in a way that most people don't. You know, because most people are going to work and they've got families and they're doing this and they're doing that. And there's there's a sense where. They have a lot of things in their life which compete for their relationship with God. And I'm not saying that that is wrong because if we've got a family, we we need to be a good mother or father. You know, if we've got a job, we need to be doing a good job as an employee or running a business, whatever. We need to do those things. But our relationship with God should be prioritized before those things to the degree that we can manage that. And that for a young girl bringing up four children and homeschooling them or something is going to be a lot less than a retired person who basically their time is their own you know so you've got to and god knows and understands all that so he's not expecting us to go beyond the measure that is possible but it's about desire and intention so if the desire of my heart is for a relationship with god I will pursue that desire and make the best of the time that I have priority wise. So no one has any more time than anybody else. We all got 24 hours in a day. Now we may expand and contract time a little bit and do those things. But generally, we still got the 24 hours in a day. It's what we do with that. And so if you're spending 12 hours with your children bringing them up and homeschooling them or whatever every day then you're going to have that 12 hours where you're not able to specifically just give that time to god but you still have a half an hour probably before they get kids get out of bed where you can and i think it's just pursuing the desire to the degree where you begin to outwork that in your life and i think you know, God wants us to know him and he wants us to know ourselves. And 
the waiting for that is not sitting back hoping for the best that one day we might know that it is pursuing that relationship it's not manipulating God by fasting and praying and trying to get him to do something. He's, he's already done it. But he wants us relationally to know that truth. So that truth transforms us, renews our minds and brings us into the state that he already knows is the truth. But it will become truth for me. And all along, the things that I'm believing, which aren't aligned to the truth, those things will fall away when i actually see and experience the truth i don't need to spend all my time trying to change my mind or renew it i just need to embrace the truth engage the truth engage the love and that will bring about the renewal of my mind to bring me into the place where i actually am who god says i am practically you know who he created me to be but for most people, you know, there's there's several ways of looking at it. Some people were like, well, the finished work of Jesus means it's done. Therefore, it's true in me now. And people who teach that, I think, can are in danger of causing people to feel condemned when they don't feel that. And a lot of people obviously don't. You know, it's like saying, oh, I'm saved now. Jesus died for my healing. Oh, therefore, everything in my physical body is instantly completely renewed and gone negatively. Well, we know that isn't true for most people who who discover a relationship with God. So it's not automatic. Because if it was automatic, there would be no relationship. And, and I think, you know, that's where I would engage. Now, for me, the danger in allegorizing everything in terms of the bible is to make it that things aren't actually real that are real and they're only spiritual so for instance i've heard people like Kay feltrad and others they're talking as well heaven is in you you know it's in you yeah and and in a sense they're they're sort of almost saying oh well there is no actual heaven there is no actual real place that you can go now because it's in you. Now, I know the kingdom of God is in us. And there's a, a sense where the presence of God in us is a manifestation of heaven with us. But it's not heaven. You know, all of the heavenly realms and the spiritual realms and the angelic, they don't live in me. You know, they are a spiritual dynamic of a real place. You know, it may not be physical as we know it, but it's no less real. And I think the danger in saying everything is just allegorically spiritually about our lives means actually, you know, oh, well, you know, we don't have to wait until we die to go to heaven. Well, actually, they're not think talking about heaven you know, in the same way that I would be saying I can engage heaven now as I can engage God within me now. So there's a danger in throwing out what is literal reality and spiritualizing it all and saying, well, those things aren't really true. They're just sort of ways of looking at our life. So they don't people like that don't believe in a literal, literal angels. Or literal fallen angels or a literal devil. They're basically also, well, that that's just the accusations in my mind that cause me not to believe the truth. They don't see it as, as a personal being and they don't see angels as personal beings well i think they're missing out on a lot if they make it purely a spiritual thing of my relationship with god and nothing else you know so there's a sort of danger if you don't get a balance in it and i think you know often when the pendulum swings back to where it should be it swings the other way a little bit and before it comes to rest in the right place. And sometimes people get caught up in where it swung up there and they've gone too far with it. You know, and I do believe in a personal fallen angelic being, whatever you want to call him. I do believe in personal angels and I do believe in a literal heavenly realm that you can encounter. And we are seated there with Christ in those heavenly realms. It isn't just figurative, 
you know, of, well, my life, I rule and reign in, with God in my life. You know, well, that's true. But there is actually on earth as it is in heaven, which is needs to be factored into the equation, really. There are extremes on both ends of everything, you know, which we've got to be discerning and not go too far and throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you know what I mean. Uh, and just find what is the truth in the middle ground that we can then live in the reality of that truth and experience the fullness of it, you know, because that's what God wants. But you can't just go from one extreme. Oh, it's all done. I just got to believe it. And that's it. It's all done. And most people who try and do that find it isn't all done and they really struggle and they get guilty that they don't have enough faith just to believe that it's all done. You know, and, and I don't think that works. And on the other end, oh, it's all about us and we've got to do everything and we've got to, you know, work out our salvation and fear and trembling and we've got to do it all. You know, there's extremes on both ends. We've got to find the balance in the middle. God has done it all. We have to come into that reality. You know, and actually, you know, in, in Romans, it, it's actually talking about creation is longing, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. It isn't talking about us waiting to be revealed. It's talking yeah. about creation waiting for us actually to be mature enough that they can recognize our sonship rather than recognizing the immaturity of our childishness, you know, which is never actually going to bring freedom to creation because creation is going to be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, which is our glory, which is in a sense who God says we are the fullness of that which will bring freedom to creation if we're not fully embracing who we are then creation is not fully going to be set free because it's down to us ultimately with god to be expressing oneness that we are one spirit with him in that union that creation can recognize our sonship in the union we have with our father not independently yeah, she does say about it being an allegory, you're right. So. Yeah, and that's going too far, you know, and I think you can allegorize some of, the, some of the Old Testament and say, yeah, there's a spiritual story here, which is not really meant to be taken literally and figuratively. But actually, I think that most of what we have in the Old Testament is actually more attuned to the people who wrote it, didn't really know God and wrote it out of their own understanding the holy spirit can take any story and apply it to our lives and bring truth out of it you know and, and that you know and that could be true but i don't think it's necessary to do that if you have a relationship with the with the holy spirit with jesus with the father that they can in relationship reveal that truth to you rather than well i'm going to go through a mediator of a book to read these stories and then i'm going to get understanding through all the stories in the book well jesus is the truth he's the living word of god i i just think there's too much focus on trying to find god in the bible in allegory and in these stories than actually we're meeting him why do i need to go through trying to find him in all these stories when actually i can meet him follow him hear his voice encounter him every day you know I, I i don't see the point of spending all that time trying to use a story to try and get us to understand god to me that's just theology it's understanding god through the bible well i want to understand the bible through god you know rather than trying to understand god through the bible because whose version of news allegorical story am i going to use you know, so I would focus on the relationship and God will reveal himself and reveal who we are in that relationship without the need of focusing on trying to understand the book, whether it be literal, allegorical or anything else. Why do we need it? Jesus didn't sort of say we were going to have a book. Jesus just said we're going to have a relationship. So I think it's a lot of time spent on trying to understand a book that we don't really need to waste you know to be honest now if, if you've got a load of people who are used to the book then you use the book as a frame of reference for them because they don't have the experience and my perspective with people who are teaching 
like that they don't have a personal experience of heaven they don't have a personal experience of engaging god on the inside they're trying to explain the relationship using the allegories of the book and the truth and i'm not saying the truth is that the finished work and the grace of god and all that is wonderful but the relationship is the relationship the mystical dimension is missing from a lot of those people's experience therefore they're using the bible for their way of explaining and helping people understand who god is and who they are but they don't have an own own personal experience of the mystical dimension of it to which they have gone to heaven and they've had encounters with god face to face and they're dwelling and abiding in the face-to-face -face presence of god they don't have those or if they do they're not sharing them you know and i'm not saying that they don't because i don't know them well enough to know but they're not sharing that side of the personal relational encounters with god they're still trying to make it a, a different belief system it's just well we've got to believe differently about god because he's different and he's grace and love and all awesome but actually it's not about believing that it's experiencing that because when you experience it, of course, you're going to believe it. If you're just trying to believe it, it's just another belief system that you're trying to have faith in. And I think there's a danger in just creating another good belief system, which is probably mostly true, but is not fully encountered. And I think experiencing the truth is way, way different than believing the truth. So if you've experienced Jesus as the way, the truth and the life and you've encountered him face to face and you've talked with him and he's talked with you, that's way different than believing what he says from what the Bible said he said. You know, and it may be true. You know, and I resonate with a lot of what these teachers say in terms of the love of God and the unconditional nature of God's love and grace and amazing things. But I think there may be something missing if you're not encouraging people to have those encounters that are actually real and not just things that you're trying to believe. Mike, one of the first, in my first encounter, I mean, um, what he said was Jesus, for the first time, uh, I understood what he said. It was crystal clear. And he said, I want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think most people don't realize that God desires this kind of friendship with us. Um, it's not just us pursuing him. He's also pursuing us. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's It's sort of become too tied up in performance of something rather than enjoying the rest of relationship which then means you just do things together you know i don't want to do things for god i would love to do things with him but not for him because then it's almost like well i'm trying to serve him you know he didn't want me to serve him he wants to be a friend as you say jesus said well i'm not going to call you servants i'm calling you friends because the way i I am with friends is very different than I am with people who think they're servants. And it's not God that wants us to think we're servants. It's really coming out of the sort of wrong understanding of, you know, who we are and our relationship with God has to be earned in some way. Therefore, I'm trying to please God or be obedient to God and, you know, be a good steward or servant. Well, you know, God doesn't want me to be a steward or a servant. I'm a son. You know, and having have a relationship as a son with God is very different than those who think they're operating in some sort of role as a steward of God's resources, or whatever. And I'm not saying sons shouldn't be good stewards. Of course we should. But we're doing it from a completely different perspective. A steward does not have ownership. It's a job. A son has ownership, so is using resources wisely because they're his if you like um so i think there is a different way of looking at it 
And and I think people don't get that friendship dynamic of it. You know, and there is a sense of God's holiness and his awe and wonder and awesomeness and just oh it makes you feel amazing to see the awe and wonder of God, but we should never lose sight of actually he's our dad. And he he wants to be a friend in that relationship and not just be he's on the throne and i can't approach him you know and there is a sense where yeah i i recognize he is king and he is creator and he is king of my life and but he's my dad the king not just the king you know and when i'm on his lap he doesn't ever act like a king you know he's not there you know with a crown on on my lap when i'm on his lap enjoying fellowship on the throne of grace you know it, it's not like that there yeah, so. so this process of maturity it mm -hmm. also uh, continues in the afterlife um yeah i would say so yeah uh, there's a sense where if it's not then it's not relational again you know, it's, oh, well, I die, go to heaven. No, I, everything's everything's brand new. I'm completely restored. I know everything. Well, how did I get to know everything? Oh, well, it was given me as a download. Well, then, well, how did I get to know that? I didn't get it to know it relationally, so I'm missing the relational aspect of it, so I don't know everything. You know, and I think that's why I do believe there is an ongoing process of maturity coming into the reality of who we really are should we happen to die or if you don't die there's a, a part of maturity that can only really be outworked in the realms of heaven as we mature in our position there as well as mature in our position here and that i think is why i think there's a missing element to a lot of things where people are just taught about to believe and outwork it here rather than where we're seated in heavenly realms that is a dimension that requires maturity as much as me maturing in loving people caring for people you know outworking that love on a day-to-day -day basis on earth it still needs to be established in heaven and that is a, is a maturing process there i mature in my position of government so i go from sitting on a mountain ruling my own life to you know being a lord and a king and a son in progression of maturity you know god is not going to give me you know the the rule of you know 25 galaxies when i can't even rule what's going on around me every day you know so there is a sense where he is going to give it to me always giving me a little bit more than i think i can probably handle so I'm requiring the ongoing relationship with him rather than, oh, yeah, this is easy. I just go on and do it. You know, no, I do it with him. Um, you know, but he he gives me that maturity as I mature. And he gives me what is the responsibility that comes with that maturity in government. You know, um, and there are different roles, too. You know, there are lots of different roles in government and we don't always have the same ones. But we all need the same character and the same operating in love you know because if we don't know the love of god we're going to govern very differently to when we do that's why he doesn't want us to govern out of our own understanding and our own knowledge because we'll try and do it in our own way which won't be very successful yeah and god doesn't want to you know destroy the universe by giving it into our hands with the power to destroy it with a word you know which is why my words don't have the power to destroy the universe in reality when i mature like god then those words do have that dimension of power but of course i'm also matured in love so i would never use it in a negative way you know which is why maturity goes along with love as a motive you see i could be mature in knowing what to do when to do it how to do it but if i'm not doing it in love 
then I'm still actually not doing it as God would do it, which is the key. I guess the issue, though, is that if I yep. listen to you, is that throughout all of the history of mankind, it's probably somewhat remote that anyone ever comes into any deep relationship with God. First of all, because we all have to overcome the religious part, and they have, I mean, they're, there, there is risk. They were as religious in the centuries before us as they are now, and that's a huge thing to get around uh, to go into to move into the relationship aspect of it. I'm just thinking of just going to growing up in Sunday school and church and everything else. And my uncles we love God, but it was is exactly what you said. They, we all we spoke about how do I know Jesus? I have a personal relationship with Him. Mm. We sang songs about the personal relationship. And we yeah. believe that because the book told us that. Yeah. And it almost it's almost near impossible for people to actually have ever come into a real relation. I know there are smatterings of people. Mm. And then with everyone, and generally speaking, just the, of our mindset we are, we're all living it, we're raising it, growing up. And as you said, we have limited time. But we also have a, a survival mentality. We're just trying to get through this and get through that and the next thing. And the relationship with God does take time. Oh, it absolutely does. And that's why most people in history who have had a mystic, intimate relationship with God have been those who were able to dedicate the time to it. You know, Julian of Norwich lived in a cell attached to a monastery or whatever it was. You know, so she lived in a small, with no... You know, she didn't have TV or things to distract her in the same way as we do today. Yeah, she didn't have modern conveniences to make things quicker either. But she focused on that was her life. You know, um, and I think looking through history, the mystics are those who've gone and lived in a cave or, what, or whatever. And, and they have this relationship with God because they've not lived what we would call normal everyday life. But I do think it's possible to be able to have a everyday life um, and live that from the relationship that we prioritize with God so that that everyday life is so much better than it would be without it. You know, and therefore, I do think you're never going to have an intimate relationship with God if you don't pursue it as a priority, even if it's a small measure of time for me i always wanted to give god the best of my time so for me that would be when i got up because nothing had happened in the day you know i slept all night or whatever i get up i'm ready to engage with god for this new day new mercies every day fresh mercies you know um some people, well, they look at the end of the day as better for them. For me, it was, you know, we never was. You know, so it was always, so I'm going to give more time. Now, there's a sense where discipline of saying, well, I'm going to make it happen. Not because I have to, or I fear not doing so, which is, again, a wrong motive for doing it, but because I want to, because I desire that relationship with God and intimacy. So for me, that was always, I'd get up early and I would spend some time with God before the house got manic with all the kids running around and everything happening. So, you know, so I, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was never a morning person. You know, if I got up at eight o'clock, I'd be like, God, this is early. You know, it, I just didn't wake up early. But as I became an adult, I trained myself to be a morning person, which meant when I wake up, I wake up. I don't sort of like, oh, I'm going to stay in bed for another hour. You know, I get up or I wake up or I'm, I'm alert and ready. So for me, I would then go down and find a quiet spot, comfortable spot in, in a chair, and I would engage with God. And out of that sort of pursuit of relationship you know and to begin with that was reading the bible praying doing the stuff that you were taught to do 
but God used the time to transform the time into a intimate time of relationship and communication and conversation and everything else. Um, but I started where I started, but that discipline held me well. So when I then encountered heaven and started to engage God in a heavenly perspective, it was like, wow, I want more of this. You know, because in the beginning, I was trying to record all the things I was experiencing, which was like doubled the time that it took to do it, you know, until I learned to journal as I was going. So in the beginning, it was like, right, I'm going to get up an hour earlier. Because, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, well, I'll cut my time short to half the time and half the translating what happened. I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to lose that on the amazing time I'm having. I'll just get up earlier. So I got up an hour earlier. You know, and then as I learned to journal. As I was going in the in the experiences I was having, then I didn't need to double the time. So then, you know, then I didn't sort of get up as early because I didn't need to, you know, but actually, you know, the times I had with God, I couldn't take more in a sense. You know, it was like an hour or an hour and a half was as much as I could manage in terms of the much of the revelation and the conversation and the things happened for me even to contain. So it was like, OK, three or four hours. I mean, you know, having a mystic relationship where you're spending five hours with God in. I mean, God, that's a lot of stuff, particularly if heaven's on a different time scale and you're how do you absorb all that? You know, for me, it, it was, you know. I was able to do it within the constraints of an hour and a half to two hours, depending on, you know, what was happening on the day and other things. But I had to pursue it, you know, and I think that's the key. And I think anybody, if they have a desire, you know, a friend of mine always said, pursuit is the evidence of desire. And you can say you desire something, but if you don't do anything about it, then you really don't. You might wish for it. But a desire is a motivating force for good. You know, with the right motive of heart, those desires meant I pursued it and I experienced it and that changed me. And then it created the dynamic that I could live in the uh, consciousness of that relationship without having to spend all that time. You know, it becomes a constant dwelling, indwelling, abiding presence, me abiding in that spiritual dynamic, learning to, to dwell both places, you know, in, in a multidimensional sense. So that came out of my pursuit in my relationship with God for God to be able to expand what was possible. You know, now, now I spend less time in what I would call your traditionally your quiet time or whatever. But I have a deeper, intimate relationship with God because it's a constant awareness and sensitivity to his presence. And that for me is meant I'm enjoying life in its fullness in, in its abundance in a way that I wasn't doing before, you know, um, but you never, if you don't pursue something, you're never going to find it, are you? So there's a sense of why you're pursuing it is the key. Don't do it out of duty, obligation, fear, performance, out of desire. I desire intimacy with God. I desire a deeper relationship. And that desire meant radical decisions. God, do whatever you need to do in my life to bring me to that point. Get rid of everything that needs to be got rid of. Change my thinking. Heal my heart. You know, do whatever you need to do. I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice. You prepare me. And he did. You know, and that was the thing. You know, it's like I every day it'd be like, God, I don't want my will today. You know, I don't want to do things because I want to do them. And I'll, I'm, my will is in play. I don't want a free will. I just want to be at working your heart so every day for years i would say i don't want a free will today i don't want choices which are going to be independently made i want to be intimate with you and that would inspire what i do you know 
but it took a long time you know it's not like a you know the matrix you plug plug in a jack plug to your back of your neck and oh i can do kung fu you know <laughs> you know you have to learn how to do kung fu if you want to do it and if you've got a desire to learn how to do kung fu you would have to train and you'd have to exercise you'd have to get a teacher you'd have to do all those things you know it's, and it's with god my desire meant that i gave myself to whatever the process would be to bring me into a place of intimacy and you know identity knowing who i am you know but that's not why i went into it you know i didn't go into it so right i'm pursuing god to find out who i am that was a consequence of discovering who god is because in the mirror of his face i began to see a different person to who i thought i was yeah, but I didn't pursue him for I want to find my identity. I want to fulfill my destiny. Because again, that's sort of motivated by me. I just wanted him. But I don't believe I'm, I'm I'm not out of the ordinary. You know, I'm a normal sort of person who likes normal everyday things. You know, I like sports. I like, you know, movies. I like normal everyday sort of stuff. I like making things. I like the garden. You know, I like, you know, I'm not... a mystic in a cave somewhere you know i have a very normal everyday life um and if i can do it coming from the background that i've come from which didn't even believe in the gifts of the spirit or anything who had no real intimacy with god or any even concept of what that might be if god can do it with me and bring me to a point of dwelling in the presence of god and living this relationship then i think that every if that's possible for everybody you know i'm not any more special than anyone else you know, we're all special to god we're all created in his image we're all his children and he wants all of us to enter into the fullness of our relationship with him as our dad and i don't think that anyone can make an excuse and say well i can't do that I think all of us can pursue it to the degree that's possible within the circumstances of our life or make changes to what we do with the time we've got to prioritize it. You know, you know, and I understand the boundaries of people and different circumstances, different times of life and everything else. You know, but when I when I first started to engage heaven and it was like, OK, God, I want to I want to do this every day. I don't want this to be a one off. I don't want this to be experiences. I'm doing a testimony of, you know, 20 years later and it's still telling the same story of when I went into heaven. You know, it was like, I don't want that. It was like, how do I live this? That's what I asked him. How do I live this? How does this become my life? You know, um, and I and I said and he said to me you do it the way everyone else would have to do it you know because being a church leader who to one degree or another can sort of dictate what they do with their time some people would say well that's easy for you you know you you can do whatever you like you can go into your office and you can pray all day you know so it's easy for you i can't do that i've got to go to work so what god said to me was do it in the same time that they would have to do it before they go to work so they can't say oh it's easy for you because i didn't spend that personal intimate development of relationship in my office i did it in my chair at home now i outworked it in the office therefore when i was developing things and producing things and you know seeking god for what to share and all that yeah that came out of my relationship with god but i didn't sit in my office all day just you know meditating you know i outworked the meditation that happened in my own time with god you know and and i think that was wise you know because people can turn around and say well it was easy for you because it, it was no easier for me than it would be for them you know, if you make the choices to prioritize the time of relationship with God. You know, and I know for some people, oh, well, it's just dry and it's hard and, you know, whatever. And it's like, you know, well, yeah, it was for me at times when I was learning to try and hear God's voice and I couldn't hear a thing. And I was trying to meditate and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. 
You know, it was like, but I didn't give up. You know, I didn't give up because there was something internally which was moving me to desire more. You know, it was, I've always had that. Well, there's got to be more than this. You know, and the desire of my heart was to find whatever it was that was more than this. So in a sense, I was not satisfied with the level of relationship that I had. You know, because I thought well, there's got to be more, you know, and, you know, in the several years it taught, you know, that took me to learn how to hear God's voice. There were months and months where I wasn't hearing anything. But I still carried on, you know, until I began to tune in to his voice and listen and be able to hear. And, um, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm sort of fairly tenacious, I guess, and don't give up easy. And I think some people do give up too easy if it doesn't come pretty instantly. You know, we are living in a sort of fairly instant push button society. Oh, great. Just I want this. And there it is. You know, whereas with God, it's not like that. You can't have an instant relationship with God. It's it's not like that. It's not a takeaway meal. I'm going to make it from scratch. You know, uh, and therefore, for some people, that's. It's hard, and I understand that, but they don't have an excuse ultimately. You know, because as I say, I think I started off in a pretty disadvantaged place when it came to mystical stuff having no expectation whatsoever, having no feelings in my relationship with God. You know, I, I didn't have emotions towards God or from God. When I started off, it was purely, well, I, well, I believe this is true. I never felt anything. I never had any emotional experience until I got baptized in the spirit, really. When I got baptized in the spirit, all of a sudden I'm feeling emotions and feeling love and feeling accepted and feeling, wow, this is amazing. God, and I thought, how on earth did I live all my Christian life up to this point without having felt this? Because I believed that was it, you know, <laughs> you know? Um, but, I, but I come from that background. If feelings and stuff were sort of frowned on. And, you know, don't go by your feelings. Go by the word, brother. You know, that, that was what it what was said. You know, that, that was how it was expressed. You know, and actually there were a few guys who did, were quite sort of emotional. There was one guy called Howard, and he was in the same men's choir that I was in. And he used to cry and he would be emotional when there was like God's love and grace. And everyone would be like, yeah, that's just Howard. You know, it's like, you know, he was he was the one who was actually really experiencing the emotion of the reality of that. The rest of us were just singing the words. Yeah, you know, and, and it was sort of like a little bit frowned on to express emotion. And you certainly I mean I didn't see anyone in the Methodist church express emotion, even less so in the Brethren Church. You know. So it was like not something of the normal thing for me in my life. Yeah. But God overcame all those obstacles and barriers and eventually brought me into a emotional relationship with God, which went deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. So I do believe it's possible for everybody. That's actually very helpful, Mike, because uh, yeah, in the Baptist church, emotions were frowned on where I was brought up the same thing. And, and it, you know, I'm having that, you know, now that I've retired, I, I've got this time and, and now I'm going, well, I'm bored. So, <laughs> but God told me that I've got to get balance in my life. I'm thinking, oh, oh, oh. so, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I guess what I discovered in discovering intimacy, I discovered creativity. So I never get bored of doing nothing because I, I can always do something. I can always make something, you know. So I found life became much more creative the closer I got to the creator, realizing I was made in his image and finding that I could enjoy doing things. Um, and I would never get bored. You know, I'd never get, oh, what am I going to do today? 
well you know i, you know, I was this morning it was like oh I, i'm doing my patreon teaching on sunday evening so it was like okay i need to do some stuff with that so i woke up early and i went through the things while i was in bed on my phone and i was going through the slides made some corrections and do some stuff then went down and redid that and then it was like oh we're gonna do that oh I'm gonna, i got some stuff in the workshop so i went out and put the carcasses together to two boxes um with finger joints which i've now got to go and you know put together and glue up and make a top and a bottom for you know and it was like you know i i like doing stuff like that you know so i never get oh what am i going to do today it's like i can always find something to do that's creative and actually, I can also sit and watch a movie or something, which I enjoy as well, because I find in sort of things in other people's creativity. You know, I like watching other people's creative expressions and I find movies and things like that quite creative. Yeah. So, you know, life for me is is joyful. You know, I'm living in that state of it being joyful. Everything is joyful. It's an opportunity to enjoy today. You know, if it's raining, I can go in the workshop. If it's sunny, I can go in the garden. You know, and it's like I see it like that. You know, every every day is an opportunity for me to enjoy life and God to enjoy me enjoying it. And that's what has changed. I feel God's pleasure in my enjoyment of life. And it didn't doing great spiritual things it's just enjoying everyday life having a chat having a, a you know not that i drink coffee but i do sit down with debbie who does, does drink coffee and you know we have a chat while she's drinking her coffee and we look out at the birds out the window and we we enjoy that for me is enjoyable and i find joy in it and i can celebrate that you know it might seem to other people well, well that's really just a bit mundane but actually, it's only mundane if you treat it mundanely. If you see life as something to be lived in abundance with joy and passion in that sense, then you know, life is, is good. You know, all the time, you know, for me, it's like I don't ever think, oh, God, I wish today was over. Or, oh, what am I going to do today? It's like, there's a billion things I could do today. You know, and I can enjoy all those billion things. Now, some people will be like, oh, how can I choose one? Well, just go with what you feel the best. You know, <laughs> you know express it. Ex you know, joy, I think, is, is, is the economy of heaven. You know, love, joy, peace. You know, they're all, they're all together in, in rest. And I think that that is how the very air that we breathe can be life, you know, and, and bring joy to us. Um, yeah. And the more joyful you are, the more grateful you are, and the more thankful you are, and therefore the more your life and your whole being becomes a self-replenishing thing of health, and our whole immune system, you know, is works functions better when we're gr grateful and and gratitude is an expression of joy so joy for me is it's not going around you know x on the outside being an extrovert because i'm not an extrovert this it's a deep inner sense of god's presence and pleasure and life you know and knowing his love in an unconditional sense which brings me great joy and therefore, the things of life bring me great joy. Mike, I don't know whether you have time for this one. Um, just the geopolitical situation in the Middle East. Mm. I mean, if Israel retaliates and then they retaliate back again, mm. uh, it might start a, a baby start of the Third World War. Well, I don't know whether it's already started. Now, I recall... Um, uh, Nancy Cohen talking about the Prince of Persia uh, when she actually tackled him. So, is is it 
it it could things be um, a, a better have a better uh, sort of mm. outcome if the uh, legislate against the uh, the principalities there. Um, I think restoring the principalities and seeing them operate as peacemakers rather than warmongers probably would be, you know, a, a good thing to do. Uh, and definitely finding, you know, that, I mean, I, I've got no patience with either side in all of it. It just seems they just want any excuse to fight, you know, and you know and you know i don't i don't take sides in it and god isn't taking sides in it either war is fundamentally completely contradictory to peace and jesus is the prince of peace and blessed are the peacemakers and god's desire for living on earth is to live in union relationship and to cooperate together and to be peacemakers and to be in family, to be in covenant with one another, you know, and that's so contradictory to the world we live in, which is divisive and it's competitive and it's confrontational and it's tribal, you know, and they're totally contradictory to how God wants us to live in relationship and in family. Therefore, you know, you can see it's totally anti-Christ you know, anti God's heart. Um, um, but we are, you know, we were doing it, you know, and obviously you'll get one side who are following sort of a Christian Zionist thing will be like, ah, oh, well, God's behind them and they can do whatever they like. And, you know, this is God's people and this is God's earth and he's given them the right to go and do this and the other. And it's like, totally disagree with that. You know, Israel's no more God's people than palestine are god's people or arrange good we're all god's people um and we've got no special place in that or nations have got no special place in that because god doesn't desire tribalism in nationality um so i don't believe in any excuse for what israel is doing to palestine lebanon iran i also don't believe there's any excuse in what uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, or Iran is doing to Israel. I understand the tensions because I understand the history and I understand the generational issues which are still going on from generation to generation because there's not been one generation of peace since 1948 when Israel went into there. It's never got to a generation where they've had no war or conflict. So every time you're re- creating more and more people who are in opposition to one another because they don't forgive one another you know you're never going to have peace without forgiveness you know i think nensel mandela when he uh, left his cell basically i think said something like if i don't leave anger and bitterness and resentment behind in this cell i will be imprisoned for the rest of my life forgiveness and reconciliation was the key god wants us to be peacemakers i think the christian community need to be on the side of peace and not war and eschatologically some are on the side of war because they believe you know unless there's a war in the middle east and we get the war of armageddon then we're never going to get jesus to return therefore we want jesus to return and rescue us so we want a war you know I just think that's so contradictory to the very character and nature of God. You know, there's no rhyme or reason to that, really. But there is a deception of eschatology, which points in that direction. You know, so, yes, definitely. I think we should be looking to do everything we can to administrate peace. That being also dealing with anything atmospherically that is creating an atmosphere for war you know making sure that we do not carry things in our own heart towards anybody for what's going on making sure we choose to forgive each side is key you know if christians are you know holding things against israel or holding things against palestine or any other places then that's not going to help us be peacemakers and i think god wants us to be peacemakers 
in this situation. Do I think there's an inevitability of a third world war? No, I don't, because I do believe there is a lot of legislation going on to bring about peace and people are looking to dampen down things. And I do believe also, you know, God is not going to see the planet destroyed in some nuclear war or whatever, because I think there's a restoration that is God's intention. And we are agents of restoration. And therefore, you know, that means restoring relationship. You know, the whole thing of the lion lying down with the lamb. Well, if we believe that is true in terms of in God, we are all one family, then it is possible for Israel and the Arab nations to come to peace. But there's going to have to be a lot of change of mind and a lot of forgiveness for a, a, the next generation not to be repeating the things of the last generation. Just the nature of what happens generationally if you don't bring reconciliation and forgiveness. And, you know, no war is not peace. You know, because you've got to have it in your heart, not just a ceasefire. It's got to be a part peace issue um, that brings about the change ultimately generationally. But I do believe God is going to restore all things. So ultimately, I believe that will happen. I hope it's in the, this generation to come. Yeah, and we don't have to keep repeating those continual cycles of conflict. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.